And here we go. Welcome, everybody, to the Full Scale Outdoors podcast. I am Dale Luganville, your host. This week's episode, I talked to a resort owner on uh, the lake that we had a family vacation on in northern Minnesota, or you've heard me talk about it on this podcast already, Pelican Lake in Orr, Minnesota. It's just a phenomenal bass fishery, both largemouth and smallmouth in there, and uh, just fantastic. It was The week was just unbelievable. I mean, I know, I know I go on and on and on about it, but the lake just, it deserves it. It deserves the accolades. Like, the average size is, uh, you know, that, like, two and a half pound range probably i mean i caught so many of those i mean it's not an exaggeration to say i probably caught 300 over 300 fish in a week up there um like me personally and it sounds like a lot and then you start breaking it up per day i mean i was there for seven days and it's a long time but still i mean we caught a lot of fish uh the first couple of days were real fire and then it then we had uh like a cold front move in and decent north wind made it a little windy uh, and that slowed the bite a little uh, but not a ton. I mean, we we were still able to find some fish, and the, the key, the key for us up there was rocks, 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 because uh, even for both brown and green bass, because uh, the water levels are way down on that lake, and uh, so a lot of the shallow, weedy, slop spots. I mean, they held a couple fish. We caught a few largemouth there, but not like it usually is, and uh, just you know. Go with the fish will tell you, man. You just gotta listen. And so we just tried some stuff and some weed lines, and it just seemed to be, you know, you start catching some, you know, going for smallmouth, and you start catching largemouth and and just rocks. I mean, no weeds anywhere, just rocks and largemouth are there, and they're just fat, just full on fat. They're eating crayfish like crazy, and you're like, well, let's just concentrate on rocks all week. And that's pretty much what we did. And we broke out and we tried some different spots and and. uh you know, I'd keep poking my nose in some of those slop spots just to see. But, man, rocks ruled. Rocks ruled the week. That is for sure. Um, anyways, we had a great time up there. So I stopped in, um, been talking to Adam from Birch Forest Lodge, and he agreed to sit down and do a podcast. It's a quick one. This one's a little, you know, just a bit over an hour. Um, he had to he had to meet with another resort owner there at uh, Northern Lodge, which is where we were staying, and uh, talk about some resort stuff i guess they had some business to attend to so anyways um we got a lot more we got to talk about he's a super interesting cat and uh so we're gee i'm just gonna have to go back up there oh no what will i do it's terrible yeah, my roughest life you guys should feel really bad for me but by the way if any of you bass fishermen out there listen to this and you want to get up there Obviously, if you know what you're doing, you can figure it out. But there are some hazards on that lake. And let me tell you, they mark them with buoys, but some of those rock piles go way beyond the buoys. And with the water level down, uh, probably like 18 inches lower than it usually is. I mean, it's way down. There's some spots that you can normally run that you can't run right now. So, you know, think about getting a guide if you're going to go up there. At least the first day, you know, a guide on your boat or whatever, you know. And obviously, give me a call. Um I guy know that lake very very well, and uh, you know, at least you won't wreck your lower unit, you know. And if you're thinking about getting into bass fishing, um, maybe you usually go up there. Maybe you're staying up there rainy, or you're on Cabotoga with crane, and you're chasing walleyes, and you just want to try something different. It's not that far from Pelican Lake. Come on down, meet you at the dock. Let's go catch some bass. We can do that. One thing I'm not very good at, um, as far as explaining, kind of like with full scales outdoors, the guiding aspect of it is. I want to put an emphasis on like teaching, like some people that might not know, you know, it's one thing if you already know how to cast and all that stuff, but a lot of people that I've been running into lately, friends of mine, you know, I take them out fishing. They've grown up using that, you know, the spin cast rod, the open face rod, and and they're pretty adept at that. They can handle their way around that, but then they see me using the bait caster and they're like, I don't know how to cast one of those. So the guide service can also be, um, you know, a how to, you know, tie how to tie knots, how to learn how to cast a bait caster. And when you're learning how to bait, throw a bait caster, it's going to be a lot of backlashes and stuff like that. And that's totally fine. I have endless supply of patience. <laughs> and I'll just have, I have a couple of them there in the boat. And when you backlash one, I'll hand you a fresh one and you keep trying. And then when you backlash that one, I'll hand you a fresh one and you just keep trying. And, you know, I'll try to give you pointers and, and you really shorten that time frame i mean nobody really did that with me i learned just probably like most of you learned how to 
that know how to cast a bait caster, you're just trial and error. I mean, you're just blowing that reel up left and right, and then you got to sit there for 10 minutes and pick it out and get it going. And um, man, what it'd be, I wish I would have had somebody like that where I, you just hand me a fresh one and you can go, you know, right back. That's going to shorten the learning curve on that substantially. I can teach you how to fly fish. I've had people that um, want to learn how to fly fish. That's not that hard. Really, it's, it's really not that hard. Um, to get the basics down is not that hard. Well, obviously, it's like anything. The more you do it and the, the more accuracy, you know, that's going to come with practice, practice, practice. But the basic getting out there, knowing how to, you know, get a fly out there, we can do that. And that's another great lake to do that. But you can do that on just about any lake that has panfish in it. You go up there with a little grasshopper fly or a woolly bugger, man, you're going to smash them. You're going to have a hell of a good time. So that's that. Uh, game Fair is coming up. I'm going to try to get out to the Game Fair. Um, if you listen to this, uh, it'll be the weekend right following. It'll be the second weekend of the Minnesota Game Fair. And then, so it's the weekend following when this podcast gets released. And um, hopefully I can line up some more guests up there. But I'll be at the Premier Flight Outfitters booth um, who I guided snow goose hunting for this spring. And I plan on doing that again this spring. So I'm really looking forward to that. And the geese are flying everywhere. It's a huge hatch. I'm so pumped for the hunting season. I just It's hard to stay focused on anything. Anytime I start hear a honk or I see a bird, man, just don't try to talk to me for a little bit. I'm, I'm gone. I'm gone daydreaming about that. And that is like right around the corner, just a few weeks. Archery is right around the corner here in Minnesota. And that means I got to go, which I'm going to do today probably i gotta go drop my bow off at the archery shop because i'm an idiot and i tried to i was practicing but i was very distracted had a lot on my mind i was shooting like shit but i was consistently in the same place it was just way off and so i just went back to the basics concentrated on my hollow standing my shoulders my draw my anchor point breathing all that stuff but i missed one very important step in that whole process i never knocked an arrow that's right ladies and gentlemen i dry fired my bow i am admitting it to the world that i'm a dumbass and uh yeah so my bow bow pretty much um things went flying at first i thought it was just my peep sight but um upon closer inspection Pretty much the whole string grenaded, so I got to go get that dropped off at the archery shop. Hopefully it didn't wreck the rest of the bow, and when they put it in the press, it doesn't just shatter in a million pieces because I've only had it a year, and it's a very expensive bow. So that would uh, wish me luck on that. That would be really bad. I'd be super pissed, but I only have myself to blame for that one. So, um, yeah, I don't even know where you go from that. I know you're all shaking your heads at me, and trust me, I'm shaking my head at myself. So you're not alone there. Anyways. I think I covered everything. If you're new to the podcast, uh, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, go on Facebook, like Full Scale Outdoors on Facebook. Find me on Instagram, Full Scale, one word, underscore Outdoors on Instagram. Dave Lugamill on Snapchat. Um, yeah, do all do all that good stuff. Oh, and subscribe, please. You everybody got to subscribe. I got a. Uh, I get great downloads, but I go look at my subscribers. There's not that many subscribers, so we got to bump those numbers up. Rate, review, all that good stuff. Share it. Let's get it out. The more, the more this kind of goes, the more and better guests I can have, and it's just a win-win for everybody. This is uh, I want to keep doing this. This is pretty fun. I love it, and uh, so I want to thank everybody for uh, listening who has already tuned in and subscribed. Super appreciate it. And, yeah, I got to get on the stick, man. We got to get another flight companion on the books because that was too much fun. And uh, next time we just won't get drunk. Well, at least we'll try not to get drunk. And we'll see. So, anyways, on this episode, it is uh, Adam from Birch Forest Lodge on Pelican Lake in beautiful or Minnesota right here on the Full Scale Outdoors Podcast. <laughs> Here we go, boys. Go. Hey. Ooh, I love that sound. This is a good one. Minnesota from Northland Lodge. 
like to get that sound in there. <laughs> Even Check. though I know you don't drink. I, however, am going to have a beer. What am I having? Shock top. Pretty simple. Shock top. So what should we talk about? Fishing. Fishing has been awesome this week. It's, I have, like, epic bath thumb pretty much on both fingers. Sores, calluses. Yep, line cuts. I haven't been bitten by a northern today or this week, so that's pretty good. I've been cut off by lots of pike. This morning I got cut off by one. But the pattern is stuck from rock piles. Rock piles. If there's weeds, all the much better, but the weeds don't have to be there. Got lots of largemouth and smallmouth type spots this week. Yeah, same spots. Yep, exact same spots, which is one of the many reasons I love this lake so much. And I've already talked about this lake on the podcast multiple times. People are probably sick of it, but it's just awesome. There's not that many lakes in the world where you can, and I've done it a bunch of times this week, where two consecutive casts. Different species of bass. Yep, one brown, one green. And it's just, it's awesome. And the bass have like a small mouth. The largemouth have a small mouth complex in this lake. Like they just, they fight. They have that tenacity and that attitude. I don't know if that comes from eating the crayfish or what, but. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They fight though. They're just pound angry. Pound. They're just angry. They seem. They have a chip on their shoulder. Not quite sure why, but. Well, let's introduce yourself to the podcasting world. Yeah, I'm Adam Van Tessel. I live here on Pelican Lake. I manage one of the small resorts here, and occasionally I even get to go fishing. <laughs> occasionally. He's on Birch Forest, which uh, has the best beach on the lake. Yep. Well known. And and that's, like, by far the best beach. Better than the one in town. Because <laughs> the one in town is in Orbe, which Orbe is pretty much a flooded swamp. Yeah. Now we have good, clean water there. Sand goes out for quite a while. So, plus right in the middle of the lake, so we can fish both any direction of the lake pretty easily. Yeah, that's true. You're centrally located. It's not a big run. To either side. What what is it the actual acreage? Do you know off the top of your head? Just shy of twelve thousand. Twelve thousand acres. That's, so that's here's a little unknown thing about Pelican Lake. It if you take out all the border lakes in the state of Minnesota, so you know, Rainy Lake, Superior, all these things that share border or something else. And the remaining fifteen thousand and change lakes. Pelican Lake is number eighteen in the state for acreage. For acreage. Number mm-hmm. eighteen. Eighteen. Wow, that's pretty good. So I out of fifteen thousand is a pretty decent lake. pretty good, right? If you go back and you look at some like um, crude maps of Minnesota, or even even sometimes America. You know they have different bodies of water, and there are no like this no state lines or not. They're basically just showing like water, or when it was big giant territories back in the day. Sometimes Pelican Lake shows up on those maps. Hmm. I've noticed it a few times. We, I mean, because obviously we lived here. When I mean, yeah. If you look at your big lakes in in the state, you got some pretty well known ones. Mille Lacs is there, Leech is there, Red Lake is there. Uh, Vermilion's Winnie. one of the bigger ones. It, Vermilion's number five. And, uh, yeah, Pelican, number 18. Well, and Vermilion is almost a chain of yeah. lakes, really. I mean, you got some channels connecting them. Yeah, there, and there's a few times. Well, and they get pretty narrow at times. So, yeah. There's, uh, I find that interesting. There's other lakes in the state that are actually considered different lakes. Even For instance, though uh, going out of Crane. Crane connects to Sandpoint. Sandpoint con- yeah. connects to like Little Vermilion. You- Sandpoint connects to Namakin. Yeah, at what point do you draw a line and say right. this lake stops here and this lake starts here and they're all connected? You easily could chop Vermilion up into three different lakes. You could. that same stretch. So, but yeah, Pelican, but, number 18. And of the one. largest lakes, it's one of the least fished and least trafficked. So It is. I did. I have noticed the last couple of days seeing more bass boats out. So well, I, word must be getting out. I am trying, Dale. As <laughs> a resort owner, I am trying to. As am I. A little bit. As am I. I don't. I don't keep it uh, a secret. I had. Uh, I told you this earlier, but when we first met and I talked to you, and I, I think I shared. You did an Orb Minnesota post, I think, for the lake. I think I shared it or I commented on it about guiding up here. Uh, I ended up getting a private message from somebody, telling me to not talk about this lake because it's his him and his brother are guides and they you know hope he's not listening to this but i doubt that he is <laughs> anyways him and his brother guide and they you know it's one of their favorite lakes they keep it a secret like they'll bring people in they'll fly into duluth they'll bring up here they basically swear them to secrecy to bring them to this lake and i was like uh, you know i get that 
But I also there is a fine line that you need to walk between preservation and promotion because yeah, we're not we're not in a danger position. We we aren't overfished. You never really see that many boats out there, even on holiday weeks and things where you think be really busy. You don't see too many boats out there. There's always a bay. There's always an island you can get out of. You know, at the same time, I was pretty surprised. A couple of years ago when the slot limit expired, because there are 10-year permits, the slots, and we had slots in the slate for the bass. We went out. Um, they had a town hall meeting with the DNR. Everyone came in. And I was really surprised the number of people from the Twin Cities and other areas that came in here to vote to reinstitute the slots. Yeah. So people know about it. The slot's been great for this lake. Oh, yeah, really healthy for this lake. Yeah, really I used to live on Crane Lake. I was a dock boy there for three years, three summers. And we kind of made fun of Pelican. This is 20-some years ago. Um, you know, it was good for the bluegill. It was good for the crop and whatnot, but that was it. It was pan fishing only, and the bass fishermen would make fun of it. And now I talk to people on Crane because I still have friends up there, and everyone knows the Pelican's the best bass fishing lake in the area. So the slot has really turned it around here. The slot really did help. Like, obviously, we lived here. Not obvious to me, not obvious to everybody else, but I used to live here when I was, I think we moved here when I was four, four or five. And then we moved when I was in the middle of fourth grade, but we've been coming back ever since. So I've been fishing this lake for mm, pretty much 40 years. And yeah, I mean, we've seen the kind of the ups and downs to it. And admittedly, and this is probably not something a lot of the resorts on the lake would want to get out, but it's the pan fishing while good, it's not like the days of yore. I mean, you're not pulling those one pound bluegills out with no, any we see real some, regularity, but, but the genetics are still in this lake. Yeah. They still pump them out. I know in town, Norman's one stop there, they have, there's a two pounder that's mounted on the wall that was caught not that long ago. Well, a guest here at Northern Lodge uh, two summers ago caught and weighed a two pound four ounce bluegill. Because I remember Lulu Good called me. Night. Um, she wanted to get on Facebook, and she wasn't sure how to do that. So she <laughs> called me. She said, hey, you manage the lake Facebook page. Can you come over here? And you know, I come over. Oh, my goodness. Look at that thing. And we even took time to look up the state record at the time. You're looking at this massive bluegill, and it was three ounces or something like that off the state record. So there, the, every once in a while you see it. Every summer we'll see, at least at our resort, a half dozen one and a quarter pound bluegill and brought in. So you, you're saying six out of the summer. A few more one-pounders. A lot of... The eight to ten inch bluegill, but nothing, you know, the big massive ones anymore. You know, people used to talk about them the size of dinner plates. Like yeah, said, once in a while. No, the, the genetics are still in here, and as far as slots are concerned, I would love to see a bluegill slot, a protected slot for those big bulls. I'm all in favor of slots. I think the, they could use a walleye slot in this lake, especially as walleye become better known here. Our fall and spring walleye fishing is very good. Love to see a slot. And it's an untapped resource. People don't come. Most people don't even know about the walleye on this lake. People don't know about this lake in general. It it, it has the benefit and, I guess, the curse of its geographical location. People coming up from the Twin Cities, traveling this far. That's basically four hours, four and a half hours from the, twin, from the twin Cities. You're coming up this far. You're either stopping at Vermilion and not making it this far, or you're going to the bigger, better known waters like Crane, Cabotogama, Rainy, yep. and you're shooting right past. And when you've passed Pelican Lake, it doesn't look like much from the road. It doesn't look like anything from the road. It's just, this, or Bay is small, shallow, weed choked. Like, as you're driving by and you look out, oh, there's Pelican Lake. You're like, and there's oh. only a couple of motels right there. You don't see any of the resorts. You don't no, see you most don't of the lake from there. So, Which yeah. is great. I mean, I, I, for the other perspective, from the other side, you're not seeing the highway. You know, yeah, we don't have the noise. All wilderness, pretty much, and there's not that much development on the lake, no. really. And like if you, if you want to come up here and pitch docks, you can knock that out in a day, and you're going to spend a lot of gas doing it. You could easily hit every single dock. But that's also <laughs> why people come back, because once they do discover the lake, they never go anywhere else. It's gorgeous. The lake itself is gorgeous. You might as well be in the Boundary Waters. I mean, I know we're close to the Boundary Waters, but it looks just like it. The big rock outcroppings, the pines, the birches, the aspens. They're all here. The loons, the eagles. We watched an eagle today. I, unfortunately, one of the bass that I let go got gilled, <laughs> and it was uh, well in the slot. It was, well, I, I guess, hair over 17, so not huge. But the bass are so chunky on this lake. Like, their heads seem so much larger than they should be for their actual length. <laughs> yeah, the lake makeup is perfect for bass. We have the shallow yeah. lake. It warms up early. We're always one of the first lakes to ice out. Um we have good weed structure, but it's a healthy weed structure. It's not the kind of weeds that everyone complains about all the time. It's a good fishing structure. 
We have a couple of holes with the cooler water, but most of it's warm water. Lots of timber down, like I said, a lot of rock piles. You know, people worry about the boating hazards on the lake shore. Fortunately, they're pretty well marked they now. They are marked. But uh, Give them a wide berth. Give them a wide berth. <laughs> yeah, I remember those buoys are good for 100 feet. Yeah, and those buoys aren't exactly right on the hazard usually. They're just off the hazard. So, so give them a wide berth. But because those rock piles, you've got all sorts of protection for them. You've got a good food source. We have so many types of smaller bait fish with the perch, the smaller gills, you know, the baby bass, all those sort of things. Plenty of feed on. Plus the crayfish. Crayfish are king on this lake, but there's also suckers. Yeah. I mean, we used to, the farm we used to live on is uh, pretty much a mile from where we're sitting right now. And the little creek that goes into the farm pond, they'd, the suckers are around up there every spring, and we'd have some that would spawn in there. But We have a few suckers caught every once in a while. Sp- so surprises people. Yeah, well, you're dragging a lindy rig around with a worm on it. You're it, Catching a sucker is not unheard of. Yeah. That's pretty much how you fish for them. If you intentionally target suckers, you're going to drown a worm on the bottom of a, a stream or something and catch a sucker i caught some earlier this year doing that exact same thing one red horse one white sucker and i believe all we, we have white suckers in this list. that's correct not red horse the red horse are more of a river fish but uh, anyways yeah crayfish is king everything eats crayfish on this lake including northerns i've even cleaned crappies out of here that have had small crayfish in their bellies of yeah. the fish we've cleaned this week it's a strong 98 percent to throw out a number of crayfish. And Especially this time of year. Earlier in the year, we see a lot more perch yeah, in the bellies. Four or five perch in the bellies is what we found. Everything else is crayfish. Yeah. Nothing else. No sunfish, no anything. So It's, it's funny for here. me, as someone who lives here year-round, to see how the fishing adjusts over the course of the summer. Our early spring fishermen come up, and they are seeing mostly perch and a few crayfish. And by this time of year, it's, it's the reverse. And every week, it just slowly adjusts. And we'll go back the other direction a little bit in September again. But, yeah. Yeah, they'll switch. Crayfish. They'll switch a forage in the fall. I would, I would think. Um, but especially yeah. after the lake turns, we see a big change there again. If you're coming up to fish this lake, stock up on crayfish colored baits. <laughs> you're gonna go through them because uh, cause this week it's been rocks. Now this year, it's the water levels down. Very much so. And it's a big change from last year when it was record well, we high. Record high to almost record low now. So yeah. Yeah, it was great. Last year was crazy how high it was the dock here in northam was flooded yeah i had no launch it was completely underwater last year easy to put a boat on or off there you know what was great about it is that for someone who's been coming to this lake for 40 years i was able to explore new areas because the i went to fish places that i never would fish normally because it's too shallow and choked out but now it's two feet above normal or whatever what was the record like how much above normal was it I don't know the actual measurement. I know we were, we flooded. The river reversed direction last year, and I was told that was the first time since the dam That's was put crazy. in the 1970s. Um, so it backed up north of us and then started flowing back into the lake. And we just kept having to raise our docks. Fortunately, I have docks that go up and down. We were just cranking them back up. Yeah. Four more inches today. The next day, four more inches. We had a lot of neighbors. We were having to sandbag and those center blocks on the docks to keep them from floating away. Major problems. One of the resorts here on the lake, their boats got stuck in the boathouse. Came up so quickly, and since oh. they're overnight, they couldn't get the boats so out the next morning. river turned, like, now you're not just getting regular runoff. The whole well, Pelican River is Yeah, and up we had it. that one storm that dropped, like, seven inches in the day, and so that was coming into the lake. You know, first of all, the seven inches goes on top of the lake. Then you got the runoff. Then the river coming back in. So the resort where the boathouse had it, had it flooded, they had to take the consoles off. And shoved the boats under the edge of the eaves. Wow. It was just a mess. That's crazy. Huh. But, yeah, we got to, we got to fish places I never dreamed of fishing before. And they held fish. I mean, it, it, at any given body of water, when ri- water, let me say this, rising water levels are good. Because they'll, the fish seek out that new cover well, it stirs up sediment that has been stirred. Yeah, it's got all sorts of, you know, it just kicks so you, off that food chain. Yeah, it just it does the exact same thing that a wind does. You know, a wind will go through and stir up one side of the lake. It pushes all the bait fish one direction. Those bait fish are, are eating into that sediment that's stirred. So rising water does the same thing. Yeah, and so it was. we had a lot of fun fishing places. I, and I poked my head in some of those places uh, this week just to, just to see. Because I had the luxury of doing really well this week, so I didn't, like, I allowed myself to just do some stupid shit to see, just to see, pure experiments. I can go two hours without catching fish. It's not going to hurt my feelings because I have pretty epic bass thumb right now on pretty much both thumbs. So it 
probably help if I took a break. You could always <laughs> use a net. <laughs> right. Right. I didn't even see a net in your boat the other uh, day. So. It's in there. Oh. It's just well packed away. I use it on tournaments or from like a big northern or something. But Otherwise, it's just in the way. It's a big net. So. Got to have a big net. The only time you're going to need it is for big fish. That's exactly right. I should get one of those like foldable stowaway ones. Like put it in the rod locker. That'd be a little more accessible. But eh, who needs nets? when you're primarily a bass fisherman. Oh, my buddy Joel that came up here, he was boat flipping four pounders. I'm like, dude, <laughs> like, something's going to break eventually. But it didn't. Didn't do it. He got tired of seeing my posts. Of the, he was had a family vacation southwest of here. He's like north of Brainerd, north of Breezy, kind of over that, but south of Lake Leach, kind of in that, that area. And I guess fishing wasn't all that great. And, well, uh, generally, midsummer fishing isn't good. I mean, let's be frank. Middle of the summer is usually the difficult time, unless you have some moving cooler water or you have a lake that's built to handle it. It can be tough. It can be tough if you don't know where to look. And most people, you know, they, they're they just not. Your, your, every, your everyday average fisherman doesn't put a ton of thought behind it. They're not really dissecting water. They're not really breaking it down into a science where, you know, you're trying to figure out where the fish are, why are they there, what are they eating, what aren't they eating. They go to the same spot that worked for them the last time, use the same bait that worked for them the last time, even if that last time was June 10th and now it's August 10th. And that's and the big it, difference there. From June to August, you're cold water fishing, you're warm water fishing. You know, if you look at your, your fishing in the spring and your fall, they're fairly similar. Everyone always likes the spring and fall fishing because it's easy. They're all up shallow. Your summer fishing can be very good, but you've got to know how to fish warm water. You've got to be able to change how you do it. You've got to be willing to experiment and find the fish. The fish will tell you if you let them, if you listen. <laughs> and that just means trying stuff. I mean, try, even if it sounds stupid. I mean, just the thing I always say, when, when fishing is tough and you're going through your tackle box, it's time to think outside of the box, time to start doing some stupid shit, or, or hey, I read this article this one time and talked about doing this try it and it's really hard for a lot of people it's hard for me at times too we get so stuck in our patterns but you need to just force yourself to do it because you're not going to catch any less fish if well, you're you have not to remember fish <laughs> the fish are always going to need to eat yes it's not like the fish don't feed for six weeks no i was like a friend of mine he lives in north carolina i mean you're down there water temperatures get like 90 degrees in the heat of summer like you would think they would go super deep and they would shut down. And yes, some fish do slide out deep and they go, you they know, get a little lethargic. deep rock piles. But some of those fish go crazy shallow, you know, bases of the dock, right where that dock meets the water, where you wouldn't think there'd be enough water to hold a fish, but that's where they'll, that's where they're sitting. So you have to just sometimes try to go and even though it's 90 degree water temp, go find some slop. There's shade under there. You yeah, know, those the shade is particularly this time of year. You gotta think like a frog, as well as your crayfish. It's your other big feeder this time of year. And we usually come, you know, my family does a week up here every year, and we're a little late later than we usually are, but only about like a week. You know, it's usually the end of July, first part of August when we come up here, and the patterns change from year to year. Obviously, like the last year, the water levels were super high. That opened up a ton of the lake, like we said. Uh, weeds, we did really good with weedy areas because there was a lot of water underneath those weeds. Underneath the lily pads had more space underneath them, and that's just bodes well for a predator, for ambush predator. Like the bass sit there under that pad and wait, and the bluegills are snapping underneath the the pads, and it's just it's loaded with food. All the minnows are in there, you know, like it's just a perfect spot. This year, those spots hold almost no fish because there's almost no water. I mean, it's just there's almost no. We're, we've caught a few back in there, but not it's not like it usually is. So that forced us to look around. And then, you know, we just kind of slid out a little bit deeper, and that brings you to those rocks. And, you know, a good way of fishing rocks is with the good old-fashioned bass jig and a, and a trailer. And we started catching fish, and we were catching largemouth in typical smallmouth spots. They were mixed, and we weren't finding the largemouth in the shallow spots. You know, there you go. It's, they're telling you, go to the rocks. Throw something that looks like crayfish, and you're going to have luck. Yeah, you always got to think about what those fish are doing. We see the same problem early in the year. People come up and they all want to use jumbo leeches or jumbo suckers. And then you say to yourself, is that what the fish normally eat? Right. 
So they get out there, and this fish, you get two fishermen in the boat, and we see it a lot for the walleye fishermen. And one guy's running this monster leech. I don't even know where they come with these kind of leeches. And one guy's <laughs> no, running normal leeches. And the guy with the normal leeches is out fishing the guy with the jumbos. And the jumbo guy is getting upset because he spent more money on the leeches. And you're saying, hey, that fish has never seen that jumbo leech, leech before. Not sure what he's going to do with it. This is normal for him. Yeah. It might work because it's something new and sticks out. It might not work. Like, you can't get married to any one technique or right. idea. So if you it's always not working, listen to what the fish do. Yeah. Think about what they're going to be eating. And you have to remember, they have to eat. Yeah. If it's not working, it's not working. I mean, you can, you can, I mean, we get caught in that all the time. If you're like, this, I don't, I don't understand why the, the fish should be here or the fish should be biting. I don't understand. I always catch them here on this. Well, there is no always in nature. Like it's constantly changing. And just like we already said last year, the water level is two feet higher than it is today. You know, right now, if yeah, not it's at least three. two feet different, right? Yeah. Now. I mean, if not three, so whatever worked last year is kind of unlikely. It's going to work, you know, with those conditions, but. but that's the beauty of a lake like this. I see it as a resort owner all the time where the guys who come in early in the year, you know, let's say you have a guy who comes in third week of June. They're here every year, the third week of June. They swear that's the only week you can catch fish in this lake. That's why they come that week. <laughs> and every once in a while, someone they gets out of their eat comfort that zone. one week a year. Yeah, they get out of their comfort zone, uh, and someone will book later in the year with someone else, and they struggle fishing when they first come in because they fish the same way they did the other time of the year. And we just see that lake change a little bit all through the summer. And yet the guys who come in the first week of August, they come because that's the only time of the year they think the fish are going to eat because that's their best time. If you're coming up here for a week, you know what you need to do? You need to hire a guide. I agree. Best hire, investment hire you can me make. <laughs> for the first day you're here, or, you know, if I'm booked, obviously another day. And even if you are a, an accomplished fisherman. So, like, my buddy Joel came up. He just came out. He, I don't have to tell him how to fish. He knows how to fish. He's probably better than I am. He knows what he's doing, but he doesn't know this lake. Sure. The way I know this lake. So, I basically guided him for two days, two and a half days on this lake as we ran around fishing together because he'd asked me, like, uh, you know, am I safe running this gap? I mean, how, you know, or how much, why do I have to swing around that buoy? Or where is, you know, where is this cabbage patch? You know, where is a spot like this? Because this lake is very patternable. Yes. If, once you stumble on something that works, you can duplicate that, whether it's wood, whether it's lily pads, whether it's rocks, whether it's a break, it's sand, it's mud, it's whatever. This lake has it all. And wherever you find them, you can easily take a snapshot of that, look at the map, and you can find multiple more places that look just like sure, that. Sure, same rock pile structure, same yep. depth. It's going to do the same thing. There's, there's really nothing on this lake that is only one spot like this. Well, if you look at fishermen, okay, I mean, you have the average vacation person like my wife. She likes to go somewhere new. We go to somewhere... I say, hey, you want to go back to this location? We liked it. And for normal vacation, she goes, oh, I've already seen that. I already had that photo in our photo album. So she wants to go somewhere new every year. Fishermen, we're different. You know, I've learned a lake. I know where I can go. I know what I can produce. I want to catch more of the same. I like fishing the same lakes. So if you're that kind of fisherman, you're going to go fish somewhere. You're going to make a serious investment into future vacations of coming to the same lake every year. Why would you not take the time your first week or second week and hire a guide and learn it so the rest of the time you're catching fish? You know, I always tell people, think of like an investment. Yeah. You're going to spend oh. how much money on your boat rental exactly. or bring a boat, how much money in a cabin? Wouldn't you be better Tackle, off catching fish? Tackle, your reels, gas to get here, all of it. And I know it sounds like a self-serving uh, promotion, which and you're not ex entirely wrong. But even though I guide, like when we went to the Keys this year, we trailered my brother's boat down at the Keys. We got a guide the first day. We'd never been there. We didn't know. And exactly what I did for my buddy Joel they did for us and then someone's like don't run here at this tide or you're gonna run you're gonna be in big trouble yeah i hit but a sandbar it, once in at the high tide you can a shortcut to get to that bridge is right here and it was very specific he's like you got to hit this pvc pole that's sticking out that you can barely see cut straight over to that other one you can see and then as soon as you get to that one hard left if you deviate from that path by even like six to ten feet at the wrong tide, you are in trouble. And that's you can't run I, it at low tide. And you have to hit it at yeah. on plane. It can, it's a commitment at that point. You can't, because if you get off a plane, you're going to be dredging too deep to get, and then you have to idle your way out of there. But So it's stuff like that. And then it's just local knowledge of where are the bait, where's the bait at, where's, you know, 
fish this side at incoming tide, fish that side. I mean, it was, it honestly kickstarted our whole trip. Could we have figured that stuff out? Yeah, but probably would have taken more than a week. So instead, we were able to just start right there. Yeah. You know, it's, it's if you're going to go fishing, well go spent. fishing. Otherwise, you're just boating and. And and there's an element to say, hey, let's expand on things. There's an element to say, figure out yourself. But a guide can really jumpstart the whole process for you. I get it. I get, I'm a serial DIY person, and I like to figure new lakes. I often go to lakes I've never been to just for the challenge of figuring it out. But if I'm staying somewhere for a week at, on a vacation thing like we do here, I don't want. I wouldn't want to like spend the whole week trying to figure it out. And we have. We we've been up here when the when what has worked in the past didn't work. You know, we struggled the first three, four days. And then, yeah, you figure it out the last five days or the last two days of your stay up here, which is great. You figured it out, and then you catch, then you really catch fish those last couple days. But wouldn't it have been nice to just yeah, we had get a group that out of the way Chicago. on the first day? <laughs> we had this group comes in from Chicago every year in June. And the first couple of years, they, they really struggled. They liked the lake. Uh, they liked the resort. They liked the boats. They didn't catch fish. If you're going to go to a fishing resort, you got to catch fish. So the second year they came up, I really stressed, get a guide. I mean, you got two of you, split the cost two ways. You know, it's not, not the yeah. end of the world sort of thing. So they did. And every year they've come back since, I think they're on year five with us now, they catch fish during their vacation. It changed everything. Yeah. Uh, they learned a few techniques. And they learned, to what, two techniques out of 300 possibilities right. in this lake? But they can go out and they can use those two techniques and catch fish, and then they can experiment while they go and do things. And they just added slowly to it. But yeah. that was the foundational block they built on. And something I'm bad at as far as, like, promoting myself, I need to, like, because I, I'm a fairly decent teacher, I'd like to think. So it's not even, if somebody, like, I use the baitcaster rods. Sure. And, well, I also use spin cast rods for certain applications, too. They, every tool has a purpose. And a lot of people don't use that. Or they're intimidated by them because, it, yeah, you're going to get the backlash and that stuff. But I've taught people how to cast those. So it's not only just where to fish. Like, if somebody out there is thinking, like, I would like to learn how to do that, even fly fishing, I can teach you how to fly fish. Like, we can do that. You want And this would be a great lake for, for learning how to fly fish. I mean, the pan fish, and it's like there are zillions of them. Yeah, we have several fly fishermen come in to fish bluegills. It would be so much Every fun. Every once in a while they hook a bass, and then they have real fun oh, yeah. on that fly rod. That is going to happen. You you throw you put a little, like, a black woolly bugger on, dude, you're going to catch fish all day in that thing. And you're going to – you'll probably hook into a four-pound bass, even though that fly is an inch long. They'll oh, yeah. eat them, especially early in the year. If, or if there's, like, a mayfly hatch or something – Man, you could catch a walleye on that thing. It looks just like a mayfly larva yep. or, or a dragonfly larva or something. They're it very has personal. happened. I believe it. I had a really big walleye. I didn't see it. I don't know that it was a walleye for sure. We were cranking on the east rock pile, like where we started, and we went fishing together. And this was when Joel was up here, and he was just he was side scanning. We were just checking out the structure. I'm like, ah, I'm going to troll, which is hilarious for people that listen to this hashtag trolling his life uh, that uh, I hate trolling, by the way. But I was like, well, you're just idling along. I'm going to throw, you know, I was using a, a deeper diver. It's just like, well, I might as well keep it in the strike zone longer. And it wasn't 30 seconds. Right. Rod doubles over. I'm like, ooh, there's one. Ooh, that's a really good one. And it wasn't fighting like a bass. It didn't shoot up to the top yeah, and try down. to shake it. It wasn't doing those spazzy runs like yep. a northern. It was just a steady pull. Steady going down. I was like, oh, this has got to be, if this is a walleye, it's a good one. And then uh, it just, the hook just came out, so I didn't get to see it. But. Yeah, we do. Um, this lake's kind of weird for a walleye. You have to troll or drift. Vertical jigging does not work unless it's really late fall. And we're talking the back half of September and part of October. You can vertical jig a little bit. Usually we do it on accident when we're fishing for crappie. But the rest of the year, you've got to be moving to catch a walleye in this lake. It's It fishes. This lake, while it's, what did we say it was, the 18th yeah. largest, is, it fishes small. Yeah. If that makes sense to anybody. There's that large basin, that large deep water basin, and there's n nothing really out there. Yeah, sand flats on the edge of yeah, it. Yeah, and, uh, and then even the shell, there's large expanses of shallow cabbage flats that, yeah, they, they'll they hold some bluegills and the pike will be in there from time to time. But for the most part, they're dead zones. I mean, you would think really they're dead zones, it. but that's where they move into in the evenings. These walleye come oh, into sure. those flats. Oh. And we drift across them with crawler harnesses. Um, last year, I kept track. We had four 32-inch or larger walleye be brought in to be measured and released. 
and we had 12 over 30 inches. Get brought in most of them all off those flats. Nothing wrong with those. This year, my all. largest is 28 inches personally. Um, I'm still trying to get that 30 incher this summer. You and I both. But uh, I've had several 25 inchers. You know, we, we it's just all in those sand flats, though. Yeah. No, no, they'll, they'll definitely roam around on those times of the year. If the, if the bait is there, they'll follow it. And, and weed walleyes are a thing. But what I was going to say about this lake is that it there's not really a deep bite like no. you get on a lot of nope. lakes like you know we don't have those humps that they congregate around yeah there's nothing there for them and if you do have a hump it comes way up and it's rocks and there's going to be a buoy on it so you fish those transition edges like right and where i hooked that one i hooked whatever it was more than likely walleye was right where that rock yeah hump started it was flat 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 on the side scan and then I mean, literally right at the base. And that's exactly where you would expect to see a school of walleyes running, just running that edge. And that's, I assume that's what he was doing. But Yeah, in June and May, even September somewhat, I'll go out there and slow troll for walleyes. And I mean, you're on a lake like this, to, the chance to catch 30-inch walleyes there. So. They're in here, and they're completely unpressured. I mean, some oh, yeah. people fish for them, but there's really not that many. I mean, most of your fishermen out here, it seems – are pan your, your, yeah, your pan, your, a lot of pontoons, you yeah. know. A lot they, of pontoons. A lot of pontoons, a lot of, like, bench seat, you know, lawn, stuff like that, and they go out to an area, and they anchor, and they throw bobbers out. That's probably, I would say 75%, but that's probably being generous. That's the style of fishing. And what I've always said, you know, people don't, I always say people don't fish this, like, right, but I shouldn't, that's not really the right vernacular. They just, they don't, yeah, maybe it's the right vernacular. I don't know. They don't, there's well it depends on what kind of fishing they're wanting to do yeah and I mean, when we have people call into book or a lot of people come in the evenings and they'll say hey let's talk about the fishing and they want to know where the fish are my first question or my response is a question what kind of fish do you want to catch how are you comfortable fishing because for me to go through and explain to somebody how you're going to go do something who here to cast for something or other and they're a bobber fisherman it's a waste right. of both our times so we have guys who want to bobber fish so we lay out a plan for bobber fishing we have guys who want to cast we have guys who want to troll it can all be done here. Yeah, and it's you, Pelican Lake for crying out loud. Yeah, right. And you get the you get the people that this they fish this one time a year. Yep. This is it. And we it was one year we were here at Northland and uh, there was a cabin over. They had been here for like half the week, and they hadn't caught a fish. And that was the year we were lighting them up. And I'm like, that seems impossible. And I'm like, what a, what have you been doing? They're like, well, we don't. They're like, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> okay, well at least you admit that and you know that and i kind of looked at their pontoon and they weren't wrong they had i mean <laughs> the way they were rigged up i'm like all right i can kind of see how you haven't caught anything so i just i kind of gave them some pointers and then they you know they came back with some some success they weren't killing it but at least they had caught some fish you know i'm like if you go here and you throw this you will at least catch the northern I and the thing is you. people will come up here if you're not catching fish well talk about it I mean, everyone thinks that everyone has a secret, but here's the thing about fishermen. We love bragging. <laughs> so we, we have this really fun activity at Birch Forest Lodge. Every Monday night during the summer, we host a barbecue. And, you know, I'm barbecuing burgers and hot dogs or brats, or whatever, every Monday night. All the resorts come up. Usually they bring something to share, and we sit down. And the guys who are catching fish are just itching to oh, tell somebody about sure. it. sure. And the guys who aren't are hurting. And so everyone gets together having yeah. their burger and a beer or whatever, and, the guy says, how's your week going? Oh, it's not going so well. I haven't caught anything. It's, I've been here for a day and a half. And the guy, other guy goes, oh, really? Oh, this morning I caught. And they tell him. Yep. And so then the guy goes, really? What are you doing? And they want to yeah. tell their stories. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they're going to brag about it. You're going to hear about it. And then we see them on Tuesday and they come back in. They're happier because I'm down the dock working. They come back and say, how was your fishing? Oh, I did what that guy said. I was using this beetle spin just like he said. And I caught that crappie. They, they, they're going to share the story. And when they share it, listen and go do. Yeah. Yeah. And you know if they say they if they say they cut a five pounder, just trim a pound off it. Sometimes <laughs> we, we we see them. The largest bass I saw this year, uh, we had a uh, five pound thirteen ounce. I think it's our largest so far this year. We haven't we in our group here. We haven't cracked five yet. I got so far. I hold the biggest fish, and it, it's looking pretty good. Like it's gonna hold, and it's f which is rare. You would think like that I would have it like in the bag every year, but it's not the case. Uh, however, it does always get caught out of my boat while I'm in it, so I'll take that credit. But this year, it's four pounds, thirteen and five eighths. Yeah, I've got a five four, so I'm trying to get a little bigger than that. I think it was two years ago, if not three. Uh, my oldest sister Trish caught a six pound nine ouncer. Yeah, 
We, we see a couple. It's pretty rare. Um, I had one on this year. I had a monster largemouth on. It was definitely over six pounds. We had it the boat twice. Banged into the boat the one time, and I uh, reached down to lip it, and I, which was the first mistake. You have a six-pound bass on. Just get the net. Get the net. But I had a little pride going, <laughs> and I decided to grab the stick out of its caught on the side of its hook, and I went to pull that a little bit because just felt like doing that, and I popped that hook out. Uh. And the guy I was fishing with, he was a good fisherman, and, oh, we were both almost in, were in tears. He said, you just lost <laughs> a six-pound-plus largemouth. You know, we were just staring yep. at it in the boat, this monster thing. They're out there. Oh, yeah, they're there. They're there. We see a couple of them every summer uh, brought in be weighed, and then we get them back in the water. So, but so many three-pounders. But so pounders. many three- and four-pounders. So, so many, so many. three-pounders. I mean, it's... The average up here is just, it's ridiculous. And like I said earlier, the, the, the heads on them are just, sometimes you think, oh, this is a five until you get, you're like, oh, no. Then you put it on, you know, the tape. And you're like, oh, I guess it's only 18 inches. But man, it's like those. Yeah, but when I have a guest come in, they tell me they've got so a five stocky. pounder. I never argue it with them. No, why would you let them? Yeah, <laughs> you're like, damn right you cut a five pounder. Come back and catch another one. <laughs> so, yeah. But, and that's. Partially because the slot on the lake has really protected those larger fish and kept them in the water. Yeah, it's 14 to 21? 14 to 20. 14 to 20 with 1 over 20. Yeah, the, the state law is 1 over 20 you're allowed to have. So, but yeah, the 14 to 20 people throw back in. Yep. You see kids go out there. We have 18-inch largemouth caught in our dock. We had a 19-and-a-half-inch smallmouth caught in our dock this year. I mean, that's dock fishing. My nephew Trenton caught off this dock right here, which Northland's in like a weedy bay, yes, shallow weedy bay. We didn't. I don't think we weighed it, but it was a very large smallmouth. Yeah. It's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> this is you're in slop right now, basically. But he's yeah, there but that slop on this there. lake, because of the way our top water works with the frogs and everything. I mean, there's a pattern for the slop. I Ooh, fish a lot a good, of slop. There can be a really good frog bite in this lake. I, Lots of big expanse of lily pads. And yeah, I'm hoping to go out tonight uh, after dinner for about an hour and fish some top water, do some jitterbug. Jitterbug. I love you're the jitterbug. You're a jitterbug man. I mean, I'm, I'm good with it. So we gotta go with what works. Yeah, it gotta, works and well. The, there's a there's a lot to be said about a confidence bait. For as much as we say, don't get stuck in your old ways. Don't do this. If it's working, obviously, you can stick with it. But if you don't have confidence in a bait, you're not really focused on what you're doing. Well, you're, baits are meant to be used in a particular manner. Right. If you don't know how to present the bait you're using, you've got a problem. And, you know, some baits are meant to be cast out there in paws. But some e baits are meant to be... But even, like, cool. so we're using the jigs, you know, with the with the plastic trailer. And I'm using, I'm throwing a 3 8 ounce, you know, bass jig. Um, not, I wasn't really throwing a football head style. I don't no, know, it was more of a round head. Kind of a stand -up. It was a swim jig with a uh, weed guard on it, so... Yeah, it was I wouldn't even quite classify it. It's a little fatter than a swim jig. It wasn't the pointed right. nose not swim pointed jig, because nose. if you're creeping that along the rocks, you're going to get, get into in the every rocks. single rock out there this has a little bit of a no it's especially arrowhead kind of yeah. thing on it and it worked really well for i tried to find one similar i was at l m the other day ever seen what you were the throwing? ones i was using are out uh they're outcast i'll get that i mean i'm not they're not a sponsor or anything but that i do like their mm -hmm. jigs and it was uh, uh juice jig outcast juice jig is the head style i was using and uh uh yeah it seems to as long as you you crawl it lightly and you're feeling the bottom and try not to set on a rock because sometimes the way that it'll fall off a rock and you'll kind of feel it and it'll be like tick, tick, it almost feels like a, a a light bite and then you set the hook and you really drive that thing into between a crack and the rock. See, that but that's sucks. part of that confidence thing. So if you know your jig, you know your bait, you generally know the difference between a bite, mm -hmm. a nibble, a rock, and whatnot. And then that's where you get something like for myself, the jitterbug. I'm pretty good with it. I know the feel of it. I don't mess up as much. Yeah, and you saw it. it took me a while with you Jesus. to try to, you know, get the feel for them. Sometimes I wasn't sure exactly what was going on. The thing it was yep. a new bait for me. I was learning it, <clears throat> which is good to say all of us have plenty of room to learn more. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I know I do. I have a ton of stuff to learn, and it, I constantly learn all the time. But going back to that confidence thing, it's like it can be even if you're using the right bait. Let's say you have that, you're throwing that outcast juice jig, but you ran out of a certain – color trailer and you're like oh, I'm, i was getting them on this brown and now all i got is blue and as you throw it you're it's like there's background noise in your head so you're thinking i wish, wish i would have had that and you, you your patience isn't as long you know so you're like oh they're not but it's just the wrong color they're not biting on this color that you know or whatever the case may be 
And so you're not paying attention anymore to what your line's doing, how that jig feels, because your brain's not there. It's wondering what else do I have that looks closer to what I was using before that was working, when really it might not be a color thing. It might be just the way you were working it, but you're not working it that way anymore because you're distracted. So having a confidence in, in a lure helps keep you focused. So are you a, distracted. Uh, are you a believer in the colors more for the fisherman or the fish kind of guy? Fisherman in generally, for sure. Okay. Because I've seen it happen, even out here. I've ran, I mean, I, not to be sound braggadocious, but I've caught so many fish out here this week that for me to, I've just ran out of certain colors. And I've had to go, you know, the bait shop in town has some stuff, but they don't have, I mean, it's relatively small. So they didn't have the color or the style that I was using in the trailers I was putting on these sure. these jigs. Not to mention because of rocks and pike, I'm running out of those jigs anyways. I have to go to the next best thing and I'm still catching fish. I'm pretty sure even though I'm I'm sticking with crayfish colors as best I can, I'm pretty sure if I just went straight black and blue jig like most bass fish Black and blue use, is a hard one to go wrong with. They still eat it. Yeah. But because I did do that early in the week and I had that background, I was like, I should be throwing a crayfish colored thing. And so it's like I found myself not really paying attention, so I abandoned it and went to a brown and started catching fish. Was it a color thing? Might have been, but I have a feeling it was just me paying attention. Yeah, I think it's a normal progression for a fisherman to get into something that they specialize in, they feel comfortable and confident with, and they're going to stick with it and they get really good. I mean, if you look at a fisherman the way they progress, so the beginning level fishermen, they're all about, I'm going fishing. If you ever talk to them, they measure success by whether or not they go fishing. Right? <laughs> right. Usually it's a kid. I got out. I yeah. got out there. I don't care what I catch as long as I'm catching something. That, that, you hear them. How was your weekend? Oh, I went fishing. End of story. Okay, you level two fishermen. It's the kill. Actually, it's the catch and kill. Okay, so they went out fishing. How was, you know, whatever. Well, we didn't catch. We didn't get anything. Okay, so I went fishing, but now it's not successful. Or I went out there. I caught a fish. We had a fish. We had a lunch or whatever, right? The level three fisherman is the limiting out fisherman. And most people go through these in order. Okay, so they go out <laughs> fishing, and they come back, and they say, how was your weekend? Oh, I was out fishing. We didn't quite get our limit. Okay, right. who knows how many fish they caught, how many species, but they, because they didn't get their limit, it wasn't quite as good as they were wanting. Or they went out there, hey, we got our limit. That might have been the only fish they caught. But because they've met their limit, they're happy with it, right? So the level four fisherman, as, or at least how I think about it, is this specialty sort of fisherman where it's based upon whether or not the presentation style they're using works. And I, I see myself here all the time because I love topwater. I love surface fishing, and I go out there and, you know, we could catch fish all day, but if I don't get a chance to throw a few topwaters, I'm like, oh, I didn't get you a topwater, right? So <laughs> what you measure success by changes, and that that fourth level here becomes that specialty sort of thing where you get really confident in something very good. Most fishermen become catch release at this point, I've found. And then just to complete the circle, the fifth level of fishermen is back to, I'm in the boat fishing. Usually they're older by this point. You're taking someone else. How was your weekend? I took my grandson out fishing. We had a great time. So. I think I'm close to that level because – if I don't have a client or I'm not pre-fishing for a tournament or there's some, or I'm with a friend, like if there isn't some other thing going on, I don't enjoy If it's just me, which most people are like, oh, man, if I could ever just get in the boat by myself, that would be like a vacation. It's great if the fish are just like super easy and it's, you know, almost like having a TV show on in the background where you're just catching fish without trying. Sure, it's a good distraction from life. But if the fishing's tough and I don't have a reason to figure it out, I find I don't have a willingness to figure it out. I'm like, eh, it's just tough. I think I'll go home. Yeah, I, like, I find eh. myself once in a while slipping out. Um, you know, as a resort owner, you get tired. You work long hours. I mean, really long hours. And every once in a while, you feel the burnout coming on. So the best yeah. way to deal with that is to go fishing, for me at least. It I mean, be, I run a fishing resort. It would be for me, for sure. Because I like to be around fishing, and I don't fish as much as I used to because now I enable everyone else to go fishing. So, yeah, I find myself, you're right. You go out there once in a while by yourself, but there's a limit to it. Even when you're catching fish after a while, you're not sharing yeah. that with anybody. Yeah. I mean, I just enjoy having something else. and it, it can be a buddy. Oh, yeah. It can be a client, like I said, and it can be a term. As long as I know, like, I'm out here because now I'm doing the puzzle. Now yep. I'm focused on very, very finely focused on – an outcome, you know, a very specific thing. 
So. And you and I are a little bit similar. You know, I was fishing with you the other day. I noticed that you were really enjoying trying to solve my problem because we were fishing out of the same boat, and I wasn't catching as many fish as you were. Which is a terrible hallmark for a guide. Well, I mean, <laughs> you were clearly fishing at a higher level than I was, and so you turned around saying, here, change this bait, here's this color, and here I am who I feel like I'm an experienced fisherman. Um, and yet you said, hey, do this, this, and then you watched something. I started catching more fish. By the end there, especially went over that uh, last point, you know, I was matching you much closer yeah. on fish. Yep. And, and I watched you, and you seem to enjoy that solving his problem now. Absolutely. And I see the same with myself, especially when I take my kids out. I have a nine-year-old who loves fishing. I'm so excited because I never had that opportunity to go fish with my dad growing up. And my son loves fishing. And he, he'll fish every day off our dock if, you know, the boat's not available. And if there's a canoe available, I watch him paddle out all the time. He has some friend at the resort. He takes him out there. They fish this rock pile right in front. And he's teaching these kids how to catch smallmouth on the rock pile. Nine years old. Kid's got a great life. Yeah, right. And we go out there and do things. And the highlight of my summer this year was we went out to Saunders Bay. There's a rock pile right in the middle. Love that rock pile. Fish it this week. And did you do well? I f when did I fish it? Did I fish it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. Uh, yeah, I caught a really nice one out there, actually. So we go out there, and we're fishing uh, wacky rig and Sankos. It was cinnamon with blue flakes. That was, the, I don't know, sometimes the color makes a difference to me. So sure. okay. that's working well. And you know, I was watching him, and he's just retrieving it too fast. So I had caught, I don't know, three or four four-pounders at this point, and I finally said, look, buddy, you got to slow this down. So we're trying to get him slow down the retrieval. you got to let it drop all, all the, way the way down. All the way down. And then move it through slowly. And, again, this is a confidence issue here because I'm very confident with a Senko. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes wacky rig, sometimes Texas rig, but this was a wacky rig presentation. And all of a sudden, I just see his line moving across Take the water. <laughs> and he hadn't quite realized it yet. And I thought, okay. Just wide and sure enough. Then he fills it, and you see his whole body jerk with it. All nine years, you know, <laughs> 78 pounds or whatever he is now. And I'm not sure who's more excited, me or him. Ah, that's great. And he brings this fish in, and it was 19 and a three-quarter inch uh, oh, largemouth bass. You know, it was four and a half pounds sort of thing. Biggest largemouth he'd ever caught. Get in the boat and high-fiving each other. And there it was. Who was happier? Yeah. I don't know. There's that last level Hard of fishing say, where yeah. you're in the boat, and you're – passing it on and it becomes a shared thing for people i like when people in my group and boat or ice house or whatever it is are, are sharing success i only truly like to outfish like two people and it's not even joel like joel we go some days he fishes he outfishes me someday i'll fish him and it's like we're it's almost more of a, a partnership thing we don't really not i mean we kind of jokingly kind of keep score we both Really what it is, like, I know when I'm getting my ass kicked, and he knows when he's getting his ass kicked, and we don't really brag too much back and forth. You don't need to. However, my brother and my nephew, Trenton, I do enjoy outfishing them 10 to 1. That is fun, and I don't see that ever getting old. <laughs> he's right in the, in the other room. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, we go out. And Laying at uh, each other on their phones, giggling. I don't know what's going on. I can grab another beer. We, uh... I mean, our family, we always had the first fish, biggest fish, most fish contest thing going. Oh, yeah. We used and to do that. we get a little bit competitive on it. My son, again, you know, the up-and-coming uh, fisherman he is. I think it was last year we were out there. We're in the pontoon, mind you, because we had the family, three kids. My wife and I had three kids. Spring fishing. And our youngest is three now, so we've been two last year. You know, a two-year-old in a boat. It's a nightmare. So we put him in the pontoon. He can roam around and bunch of snacks and whatnot so we go out there and we weren't you know fish for anything particular just went and we're drifting along in saunders bay and with well, first fish came in the boat all right that's on the board biggest fish is on the board all well, the only thing really now at this point that's for grabs is the most fish and it's neck and neck between my wife and my son so he's got a one fish lead we said look we got to go in 10 minutes so the countdown's going she hooks another fish and it's coming up to the boat, and she goes to lift it over the edge of the rail, and it flops off the hook, hits the rail of the pontoon, and falls in the water. And she looks up with the look saying, does that count? And he, before she even gets the words out, he goes, no good, no good. It only counts in the boat. We were clear about this, right? You know, so we got a little bit of competition going on the family when it comes to fishing, apparently. Should I hook so. up another headphone, Dan? You're just going to listen? All right, that'd be weird. We can hear you in the background, probably. More than likely, if you have any peanut gallery comments let them rock 
<laughs> but he experienced kind of what you did, Adam, the other night. Last night, he went out fishing with me, and for whatever reason, we're using the same thing, and he couldn't. And it was even on that. Well, one of the spots was the same rock pile that we were on. And I don't know. I just – I had a pretty good night. <laughs> he struggled a little bit. He caught fish. It wasn't like he got zilch, but – it was definitely uh, not even. Well, not, some nights it happens. It was I not mean, blow for blow. I, uh, when I was out fishing the other night, some of mine just seemed to come off the hook. And they were good hook sets. They're ones that I would take that hook set any day. They were, I, I don't feel like there's a form issue. Sometimes you're going to have bad luck. Sometimes you're going to have a mistake made. It'll happen. I struggled early this year. Uh, it was on a swim jig bite. And I don't know what I mean. I mean, I'm trying to pick up the lake bottom on these hook sets. I don't know how they just kept shaking. I mean, I went through like a couple weeks stretch where I would lose, I don't know, let's just say 10% of the, of the bites. And it's really frustrating. So do you ever find yourself just going to something with the treble then? Not usually. <laughs> yeah. I heard like easiest way to solve the problem. Throw a treble on there. <laughs> day one. I almost <laughs> embedded one in my hand. Cause right. It, therein lies the big issue. Well, it's those little ones. It was like yeah? a, 12 inch smallmouth just freaking the f out but yeah almost right up to the barb yeah Not, didn't go past it there didn't have to do the line trick that's the uh problem with using like a jitterbug those trebles on that i gotta be really yeah. careful and you're using them at night sometimes yeah and that's the black jitterbug even at night sketchier yeah. <laughs> yeah i throw a moss boss a lot on server slurs single hook safer Plopper great. ploppers are great. Frogs great. are good. Yeah. Get a popping frog. Popping that's, frogs work really well. That's pretty safe. Frog bites are. It's pretty fun. Any any top water bite is fun. There's yeah. just not that's Well the thing about top water that you know teaching my uh wasp here is gonna get it. Um son about is a lot of times when you're fishing you, you don't know what is almost working. You can't see what fish swims up to your bait and goes, no, I don't like that color. Right, true. And so with top water, you know, they'll come at it and you'll see them swirl and they'll miss. You're going, okay. Obviously, I'm annoying them. They're coming after it, but something's not right. Why are they biting short? Or do I need to throw a trailer hook on? Do I got to change just a little bit? Move it slower. Am I moving slower? The or pause. faster. You know, a lot of people don't do the pause correctly when they're doing a topwater, especially if they're frogging. Like, watch how a frog swims. It does not swim for 20 feet straight. You know, they take a few strokes, and they pause, and those back legs dangle down. So go ahead. Let that pause. Yeah. Or sometimes you got to go the opposite direction. Oh, good. Sometimes you go the opposite. Go faster. Go faster. They're not feeding. You're just getting them to yeah. just trigger. So He's sitting there in that log, and all of a sudden, oh, shit, something's there. And it, it just, like, instinct kicks yeah. in. It just reaches so out So change to it. a buzz or a torpedo or yeah. something like that. Something that's going to really irritate yeah. them and keep ripping through. Or a devil's horse. Underrated lure. Never even heard of it. What is it? Devil's horse? It's made by Smithwick. It's a long stick. Oh, is that the propeller on blades. both ends? Yeah, double propellers. Three trebles those. through it. Don't use it. Yeesh. Gotta watch your thumbs there. Whopper ploppers are good. They're versatile. And they're the hot topwater bait right now. But you can steady retrieve them. Yeah. It gives a nice blop, 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 blop. Yep. Kind of like jitterbug sound. Kind of. I mean, the jitterbug, when you're walking, it has that kind of yeah. blurb, 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 blurb. Um, so the whopper plopper does that. And if you want to, you just retrieve faster. And then you start getting that buzz bait kind of yeah. sound. Yeah. You can also like that prop, that whatever you called it, the two propeller thing. You can rip it. Pause, yeah. rip it, pause, rip it, pause. Same with the torpedo. So there's a lot you can do with it. Yeah, torpedoes. Don makes a yep. great torpedo. Uh, I I like poppers for open water applications, you know, not slop. With slop, you pretty much have to use a frog because yeah. what else is going to go through it? But um, open water, I like – well, I am – the whopper plopper is starting to grow on me, but I like the walk the dog like a spook. Yeah, Zara spook's a great yep. lure. I like the spook, and I like any kind of popper, like a rebel pop R or something like that, or, you know, skitter pop, yeah. grapple skitter pop, anything, you know, pop, let it sit. Pop, One time, let it sit. I caught a lake trout, a uh, 27, 28 inch, you know, pretty good sized lake trout on a Zara spook. <laughs> really? Not sure what that thing was doing there. <laughs> huh. But uh, well. we were fishing large pike. And it's all that silhouette. See, I don't think color is too important on a on a top water bite because they're silhouetting yeah. that thing from the sky. So that's why the black works so yeah, well. Yeah, pretty I think. much have dark and light depending yeah. on water conditions. You know, if, if it's so. Really that clear. is true. Why is it then that the black jitterbug seems to be the best one at dark? Uh, probably. <laughs> I've never figured that one out. Confidence. Hmm. I mean, probably confidence. If I had to say, because it's. Not, I mean, it might matter. I mean, maybe it sticks. I mean, 
a black's going to have virtually the same silhouette as a yellow at night. Yeah, I mean, yeah at night. In the in in the absence of light, most colors are gone. Yeah. I mean, so a white would probably maybe would reflect some moonlight if there was moonlight to be had. So that might matter if it's already up on the surface and it's kind of more looking at it at the side. But your most top water baits are silhouettes. With that said, I know a lot of guys, especially smallmouth guys, use a clear yeah, on their top waters. So I think they're more like the the bait that they're using the size kind of is giving off that disturbance, that rattle, that whatever, but they're really honing it. The fish itself is kind of honing in on the sound. And then I think it's giving a smaller profile when they're looking at it. And a lot of times smallmouth don't want big baits. Although with that said, musky fishermen catch smallmouth all the time and big smallmouth all the time throwing giant musky topwater baits. Happens all the time because they're just so aggressive. They're territorial. They'll, they'll right. you know, if they own that rock, and you're using the big musky bait, it's basically they probably think it's another bass. They're like, get out of here, Holmes. Yeah. This is my rock. And next thing you know, you're reeling in a five pound largemouth on a, you know, giant awakener or something or <laughs> giant jackpot or something. It's silly, but they do it. It happens all the time. We talk to musky fishermen, uh, like on Vermilion, happens all the time. So, something to. You said, and that's kind of goes back to what we were saying. Like sometimes you have to trigger the bite. They're not feeding; it's a reaction strike. So going faster sometimes. I think bottom the the story or the moral of that story is if it's not working, change it up, change something up, change your cadence up. Because if two people are fishing in a boat using the exact same thing, and one person's catching most of the fish, there's a reason. Yes, it can be multiple things. It can be the way they're retrieving it the length of the pause, it can even at times, if the fishing's really tough, come down to line diameter, line color. Are they, do they have a leader on? Are they throwing straight braid? It can be a lot of different You know, factors. a leader is, I think, a lot better factor than people think it is. Especially in clean uh, water. I pretty much refuse to use any leader anymore. I know you lose a lot of those northerns, but... Yeah, I... The only time I use an actual, like... Steel leader is if I'm specifically targeting. Yeah, northerns. Toothy Otherwise, critters. yeah. And even then, you'll catch more if you don't. Yeah, I can't. Stand You're better off getting. More. I mean, they they make some musky leaders. And this the ones I usually use. Are they're basically really, really, really heavy, um, like fluorocarbon, like 120 pound fluorocarbon leader with the swivel and a clip on each end. So that fluorocarbon virtually disappears in the water. Give yep. them a much more natural presentation. Although you don't, you don't have the weight of it pulling it weird. I don't know that muskies care, seeing as how they'll literally come right up to your boat without giving one flying. <laughs> they're just they're just right there. They don't seem to line shy. Uh, but the times when I kind of even for pike, I don't even out here. When I, I want to go catch pike. We want to catch stuff to eat. I don't put on a leader. I'll throw something flashy on. You just get better action out of your lures yep. without that steel Don't like steel in front of it. That's just ridiculous. And, yeah, you're going to lose a couple lures. It's just going to happen, whatever. If you get more bites, I think it's you, there's a net gain later. You know, you're going to catch more fish. You're going to have more hookups. Yeah, there's a few leaders, a um, couple Canadian trips where we were just targeting monster pike. You know, we just needed it, but. Yeah, and then that makes sense in those in those applications, but. If you're worried about losing your rap your your rapala that you're trolling for walleyes or that you're casting for bass and there's northerns in the area, so you're putting that leader on just because you don't want to lose it to a northern, you're not gonna get nearly the bites on your targeted species. Right. Because you're worried about losing that bait. Right. Buy five more of those baits. Take the money you would have spent on leaders, buy a couple more grapplas. And then just when you lose one, you lose one. Tie on a new one. That ain't a big deal. Yeah, that's why I always have several of everything I like. Yep, that sucks when you don't do that because you you get the thing, the the times where they are very specifically biting only on one style or one color or whatever, and you run out of that one thing. So yeah, several years ago. Not much worse. I was just learning to fish, and I, I got into the jitterbug early, and it's always been one that I really enjoyed. I had a very good friend who taught me how to use the jitterbug, and he was really good with it. And 
So I got to be pretty good with it. And a couple of years of doing that in the summers, and I went on this uh, trip up into Canada where we canoed up into the Quetico with a bunch of guys I didn't really know very well, but we had met, and they had one spot open in a canoe, and they said, hey, you want to go? And I said, sure. I mean, Canadian fishing in the Quetico had heard things about it. So we get out there, and I have a couple of lures and nine jitterbugs sort of thing. <laughs> I've got you know, mostly frog, <laughs> leopard frog this, some blacks and whatnot. And I was the only one catching fish. And every evening, I mean, anytime evening morning I go out there and I was out fishing these guys, eight to one sort of thing. You know, there's three canoes of us and they're spreading out and I'm just catching monster bass and pike, actually. So we get back after the first day. One of the guys says, what are you doing? And I said, it's a jitterbug. And he goes, you got any more of those? Well, me. Yeah, 50 know. bucks. Right, right. That, that's kind of <laughs> where it went with this sort of story. And I think it was about 30 bucks a piece, I said. Uh 30, 30 bones, and it's yours. So he says no. <laughs> First thing, next morning, same thing. And finally, so one of the guys goes and hands me $30. Hand him a jitterbug, right? <laughs> so I sell like seven or eight of these on this trip. You know, $200 in my pocket. Nice. Everyone's catching fish. Sounds like a really great story. They never invite me back. They went every year. <laughs> so you got to be careful with that because we had a great time. They all learned a valuable lesson. I learned the most valuable lesson. Uh, Don't rip sweet. off the guys that you're fishing with because... You don't get to go next that's time. That's hilarious. Well, I think that from talking to you just a few times, I think that kind of carries over in your professional career and the way you're kind of running Birch Forest down, you know. And so, I mean, how how did you get into wanting to buy a resort? So I was a dock boy up here um, on Crane Lake for three summers. Right before I graduated high school, I tried to join the military, and I was disqualified for medical reasons. I had a rough year in high school at one point, and they had some rare disease called Epstein-Barr virus. Not that rare, but anyway, because of the time in the hospital, the military disqualified me, and I was really bummed out about it. Went to school one day, and a friend of mine kind of said, yeah, school sucks. You're right. This is horrible. When we were 17 years old, our whole <laughs> world ended right here. And <laughs> so she said, we should skip school today. And I said, okay, yeah, sure. Well, we didn't want to get picked up for truancy, so we ended up at the local community college because kids walking around look normal there. <laughs> so we ended up in the computer lab because there wasn't anything to do, and we were playing uh, Duke Nukem. I remember that game. Hell yes, I right? remember that, na- or that game. Big time game in the 90s. So we're playing Duke Nukem, and we suddenly remember that I'm not a big fan of computer games. Never have been. I like being outside. So um, lost you for a second. So, can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you now. Okay, I can hear you. So we were sitting there, and I ended up Googling summer work because graduation is three weeks away, and I don't want to stick around the farm in Utah anymore. And if I stick around, I'm going to be working on the farm for Dad. And so I found some jobs, and I threw out a resume, and this resort in Minnesota calls me. And so I land this job on the Internet. You know, this is back in the late 90s, before we all get jobs on the Internet. Right. And I went into the bus station. I bought a Greyhound bus ticket. My parents were thrilled because – I was moving out. They got they rid were, of you. They were, I mean, I was 18 and a half. They were tired of me. I was tired of them. I very, get that right, Savannah. Very uh, <laughs> mutually agreed that we were parting ways for a while. So I ended up here in northern Minnesota, and I loved it. And I was, it was everything I've been looking for in life. Everyone was happy to be on vacation. I got to be outside almost every day. I was constantly solving problems. I never did the same work schedule twice. Some of the jobs are not fun. Oh. I don't like cleaning the fish house. Scooping weeds off the beach is not fun, but some of their parts really are. And so three summers of working for that resort, and, you know, I was, what, 20, did some other things in there. Went to Korea for two years. Winter in Colorado working for a ski resort. So by the time I'm 23, I decided it was time to go to college. And I was going to be an engineer. That's what I told my boss, and he started laughing. And he said, really? (laughs) You're going to be an engineer? You? And Thanks first, for the confidence. At first, I was offended. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he goes, have you seen a cubicle in your life? Oh, God. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, they're not that bad. He goes, you in a cubicle. You're like the worst person yeah, for a I'd cubicle. Be the first thing I would engineer would be a noose right? for myself. So he said, you got to think about that, Adam. You, you're you're great on the docks. You're great in a resort. You're great in the, the always changing. Never know what's going to happen. Never know what the weather's going to do. He says, that's what why you're good at this is because nothing is ever the same. You go in a cubicle, it's going to kill it's going to kill you. So I thought about that and ignored it. In the first year of school I studied engineering and it was horrible. 
you know, just the idea of thinking about someday sitting in that cubicle, looking at whatever uh, drafting, it was, drafting whatever things, doing, and yeah. sitting at the computer screen all day, every day. And so I ended up going into business instead, and I got a degree in hotel management, and I started working tourism more. I went to the Florida Keys for a while, and I ran a submarine there, ended up in Hawaii for a couple of years. Ended up in Ely, running an outfitting business. Wait, you ran a submarine? Yeah, we took people on underwater excursions in the Florida Keys to look at shipwrecks. That's awesome. I know. It was, it was a good gig. <laughs> so <laughs> I, was, I, was di- pre- I wasn't prepared for that sentence. You're like, I ran a submarine. I was thinking ran a hotel or a lodge. What? Well, you're a different kind of sub, Dan. My, my brother Dan was on a nuke sub chasing whales under the Arctic ice. Yeah, we would take people off cruise ships and we'd take them down 100 feet. Um, so I was part of the dive team that, f- that mapped out the pattern and the course that the submarine would go. I was, I was the business manager of the store. And I uh, did a lot of little things for it and really enjoyed, once again, it's the flexibility of tourism. It's never the same, even on jobs you think are going to be the same. So after a few years of doing this, the wife and I just kept talking. And then when we were dating, I used to tell her, someday I'm going to own a resort. And she would say, oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. And someday it got closer and closer. And we finally said, you know, we'd like working together. We should do this. So we had a house and decided to take a mortgage on a house and put Try to buy a resort. And it just has worked out really, really well being in the resorting world of, you know, everything's changing. And was Birch Forest your first resort? No, actually it wasn't. We uh, had a partner. We were up on the Gunflint Trail for four years with the business partner. After four years, we found out that partnerships can be difficult, sometimes <laughs> really difficult. <laughs> and it was time to move on. So we left that and came down here. And Birch Forest was the very first resort that I wanted to buy, though. When I was going to school, I had to write a college paper on resorting, and I contacted 72 resorts that were for sale across that's the U.S., cr- that's and nuts. I created a big algorithm trying to find anomalies in them, that what would cause them to go under, what caused them to be successful, and we identified several key points of a successful resort with this mathematical formula. And so when we ran them through, Birch Forest came up really high on it as potential, and this other property did as well. So we came to Birch Forest in 2009, made an offer that was ridiculous, like 100% bank financing, we'll just take over. Or, And the seller said, uh, yeah, it's 2009, the economy just crashed. You're not going to get any bank financing. So we moved on, and business partner we met wanted to buy the other one because it was a money maker. And that's, some resorts are going to do decent on money, and some are lifestyle. And I was looking for a lifestyle resort. The investors don't like lifestyle businesses. Investors want money. So we went to the other one, and it didn't quite work out. We came back to the Birch Forest, and they were for sale again. Two ownership changes within that. And we said, yeah, we'll take, uh, we'll take it. And we had a little bit of equity now in a house. The economy was better, and we were able to get a bank involved. And, yeah, worked out pretty well. Great lifestyle. Your, your, your business plan going into that was far better than mine. Just the, uh, making algorithms, I might, as well, I might as well teach myself Japanese, but I basically took a large gunny sack, put all my money in it, and a couple large rocks, jumped in it, tied in a wall inside, and threw myself over the dock. So that's pretty much where I'm at. That <laughs> algorithm's been good for me. I mean, we've bought two resorts so far. We're in the process of closing on a third right now. Um, so we like the uh, mathematical approach to resorts. You have to balance it. A lot of people either only think about the money or only think about the lifestyle. And you might end up with a really good lifestyle, but if it doesn't pay the bills, yeah, dream no, becomes a nightmare. Yeah, and that's that conversation's been had in my household as we have as a family, like extended sibling family, have tossed about the idea of, of purchasing a resort. Obviously I haven't had that conversation with my wife, which would be a huge lifestyle change for her. She's a social worker, did the cubicle thing, although she's you know, drives around a lot talking to clients. Now she's accepted a position as a supervisor. Um but it would still, you know, that would definitely be a life change. But it would be a lot slower. I think she'd be really good at it. Like, talking to new people every week, playing the hostess, which she loves to do. Yeah, you got to have the balance. You got to have it all. Most resorts, when they but go she under. Would freak about, she would freak out about money. The money is tough. Um, you know, resorts, people come in, they look around any resort, they see the acreage, they see the lakefront, they see the cabins, and they see money. And it does. It costs money to buy one. Well, they, they don't see all the expenses, though. They don't see the insurance. They don't see the maintenance cost. They don't see the mortgage payment. Somehow they realize it costs money to buy the place. They don't realize that you're actually paying that money. <laughs> right. And what they really don't realize is you have this really short window to bring in any money, but yet you have a full year of expenses. 
So yeah, it's, you it's tough to balance. You explained that to me the other night. I thought it was really interesting. You know, most people think mortgage, you think a monthly mortgage. Like, that's not how it is for Northern Minnesota resort. has a pretty good setup. Most banks here understand resorts pretty well. We make four mortgage payments a year. We make a payment in July, August, September, and October. And the banks have realized that resorts have no money from, well, all spring, because you just got through the winter if you made it. And everything in May and June is paying off your credit card debt that you were putting on <laughs> right. for all of February, March, April, May. So they're going to let you get out of your credit card debt, and then you get some money built up if your season was good, and then they take it. Then they take all of it. July, August, and <laughs> September, October, they take four payments. Like, wow, look at all this money. It's gone. So, yeah, it's an interesting <laughs> one to balance. Uh, it, it takes good math. I'm fortunate. My wife has a background in accounting. I have a background in hotel restaurant management. Both of those professional like backgrounds there. It's worked out really well. The areas that kill you in resorting are legals, accounting, and marketing. I have got to have, have a legal right at the table. Got to have a good grip on all <laughs> three. So <laughs> we see a lot of failures. I've done some consulting with other resorts on the side, and it's usually one of those three that gets you. Without ha without getting in into specifics or too personal, have you ever had any legal like anybody any weird suits like we haven't had I a lawsuit. On a bottle cap on your beach, and we've had a few that scared me. Uh, we had a guest fall off the steps one evening. Yeah, he's an older gentleman. He has Parkinson's, and he fell and he broke his collarbone. And we took him to the hospital. You know, and you, you worry about things. You're going, oh, man, am I liable? Well, the thing was, he was in a handicapped cabin with a ramp. He chose not to use the ramp. You know, it's hard getting old. And he, he, he's trying to say, I, I just want to take the same steps as everybody else. He chose not to. He never threatened it. Right. He never even sure. brought it up. Right. But, but in my were, head, I yeah, was thinking about it. Yeah, I'm thinking, like, <gasps> he has a ramp, right? I mean, he, he chose not to use the ramp. <laughs> we had one a couple years, two summers ago. Someone's boat sunk. Um, they chose not to put an automatic bilge in a bass boat. Bass boats are low to the water, right? Yeah. So some rain comes in it, quite a bit of rain that night, and the water all runs to the side where the batteries are. It lifts yeah. a little bit. The waves come from that direction, fills the boat, sinks yeah, the boat. Yeah, I don't have an automatic one. You should think about getting an automatic bilge in your bass it's boat. Not. It's not. It's a switch. Whew. So I go out the, one morning to the docks. I'm the first one <laughs> to the docks every morning. I go out there, and there's a sunk boat tied up to the dock still. <sighs> and I got to walk over to the guy. And same question goes through your head. Who's liable here? It's my docs. You know, you just have these questions in your yeah. head, right? Now, should you be liable? No, but hey, people have yeah, gone well, over things. So you, you yeah. worry about it. But those aren't the legals. It's not the lawsuits. It's the employment laws. It's the tax laws. It, it's the things that you don't know. It's code, commercial construction code. Most resorts have grandfather sure. laws in them, whether it's setbacks or anything. So you go to make an adjustment. Oh, we're going to put a deck on that cabin. What's your setback law? And you've got to check these things. You've got to pay attention to it. Cause if What's you ever, setback? Does that just mean like what you're... How far away you can be from water. Okay. Oh, gotcha. So back okay. in the day, all these old resorts were all waterfront, right? Well, your first initial zone, you can't have anything with 100 feet now. Wow. So we have a cabin that burned down in 2014. It was old. It was run down. It was the year before I bought the place. The guy decided to burn it down at the end of the summer because he was tired of fixing it. It's 35 feet from the water. It still has the concrete pad there. I went into the county. I tried to pull a permit to rebuild it. The county guy pulls up our plot map, the satellite imagery. He goes, what? There's no cabin there? I said, no, it's gone. That one right there. He prints it out, puts a big X, updates some things. He says, nope, no permit, but thanks for updating us. Oh, wow. <laughs> Should have just built it, right? But yeah. you, you never know yeah. those things. Yeah. And so, What do they say? It's easier, to get for, it's easier to get forgiveness than permission? Until you're fined heavily Until for you're it. Until you're fined. Then. And they make you tear it down anyways. So, yeah, <laughs> legal. of that. <laughs> Legals can get you. You got to be really careful on certain things. You got to know when to take the risk. Marketing really kills resorts. Um, you know, back in the day, everyone did sports shows. I used to do sports shows. I'd go on the road for six to eight weeks at a time, every week in a different city and some booths. And you try to sell packages. That doesn't work very well anymore. International it still works. If you got a Canadian fly in, if you want to buy in cash because they get the exchange rate that's favorable and everything, you see a lot of Mexican resorts, you know, doing those things, but. Minnesota resorts don't work the yeah. same anymore. So you've got to be on the internet. Well, how on the internet? You know, and yeah. marketing can really get to you. It's tough. Um, and accounting, you've got to know how to do your accounting because they're going to come after you if you don't. Your taxes have got to be turned in correctly. But then you also need to know how to depreciate your assets. How do you balance out that cash flow? Cash flow is different you know, than just standard accounting, and you've got to make it year-round on your income. 
So I was telling somebody a couple of years ago, uh, our third year, we really felt like we broke through because it was the first time I knew when we shut down in s- September, October, that I could open in the spring. You have a line of credit, right? <laughs> and you always assume the line of credit's there. But what if you went in one day to pull the line of credit and the bank said, change the policy, can't have it. You'd think it's there, but it could happen, right? But I, on our third year, we had collected enough deposits and they were sent in our bank account that I knew we could cover our winter expenses. I knew I was opening the door. Three years, I didn't know. It was a big change for me, knowing I'd be open the next year. I was assumed I would. You promised the bookings you would, yeah, but. But. <laughs> so accounting, you know, that cash flow strategy, it's, it's a lot that goes into it. People don't realize all of those things happen when the resort's not operating. You know, everyone sees you from 7 and right. 8 in the morning to 9, 10 o'clock at night. Well, what about from 6 to 7 and from 10 to midnight? That's when all that's going right. on. All those emails. And how often do you get the, the, oh, what do you do? Oh, I own a resort in northern Minnesota. Oh, it must be nice. Oh, yeah, it must be nice. So you can do a lot of fishing. You have some cocktails with your guests, right? <laughs> Check in a cabin once in a while. It's a yeah. job. It's it, still a job. I, I tell people I work more in three days than most people do in a, work, in a week, hours. Yeah, there's no, there's no, you're not punching 15 the clock. 15 hours a day is you're, nothing. You're never off the clock. <laughs> so... Even you have somebody sleeping under your roofs. Oh, yeah. Even <laughs> over dinner, the wife and I are talking often. My kids the other day, I said something about, can you guys talk about anything besides superheroes? And my nine-year-old turned around and goes, can you and mom talk about anything besides business? Fair enough. And I was like, well, I mean, <laughs> it's, I didn't like the sass. And we had a conversation about it, but he had a point. If your kids want to talk about superheroes, okay. we'll go fishing. I'm a huge comic book dork, so I can I can do it. Hey, we, we talk a lot about superheroes in my family. <laughs> Our kids, I mean, it's the one thing. So we never leave the property, except for when a new superhero movie comes out. The wife stays, takes, I take one kid, come back the next night, she takes the other kid, and then the <laughs> third night we talk about it. So it is the one thing we do leave for. That in church on Sundays, we, we rotate every other week, one of us goes to church, but... There's not much that gets us away from the resort. Well, there's not many churches. Where do you go for church? We actually drive in all the way to Virginia. Okay. So we combine it usually with a grocery run. Where did we go? We went to Big Fork, right? Wasn't that where our church was in Big Fork? We're here? Yeah. Everyone's got their own way of doing things. that's not exactly right around the corner either. We have found... Well, it's because Dad never took a direct route. I wonder where this road goes. Oh, Christ. We have found that balancing personal life is difficult but important. Yeah. Our, our dad was a preacher, so okay. he preached at that church. And, uh, oh, God. Back of that uh, station wagon gets hot in the summertime, especially when you're going down an unmarked dead-end road that doesn't dead-end for 15 miles. Never been down this road and wonder where this goes. We knew we were not getting yeah, home for a while. Minnesota. Good Lord. They, just they literally just stop. Just Nothing at the end of them. Oh, you have to go already? Oh, that's so sad. It's going to be like one of the shortest podcasts of all time. Didn't get into a bunch of stuff. We're just going to have to do a part two. I'll do a part two. I'll have to come back up and part two. You got a ton of other stories to start to uh, tell. I'm sure you have Doc Boy stories. Oh, man, Doc Boy stories. You're, yeah. o- you're opening up a, or hopefully buying a resort. On Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesday, we close the deal. Let me know if that. It happens. I'm just. I'm curious. I'm yeah. pulling for you. I it, think it's that's awesome. I mean, the money's been wired. It's not like. Oh, it's it's. This is just a date on the happen. calendar at the moment. The money's there. Everything's signed. On Tuesday, we put out the big Facebook announcement and start doing stuff. So yeah. Well, if you need somebody to help you figure out those jungle rivers, you know a guy. Yeah, someone's going to bite the bull <laughs> and start doing all that research on the fishing down there. The saltwater fishing, believe, is well documented. The freshwater is not so much. So. I like a challenge. So, uh, hey. Let's do it. I got all these canoes coming along the property. Give so. out all your, you know, where people can get a hold of you, numbers, websites, Yeah, you can find medias. us uh, at Birch Forest Lodge, which is birchforestlodge.com. You can reach us at 218-757-3479. We have 12 cabins and a lodge room, six very nice boats, uh, good dock system, and the best beach on the lake. Arguably the best bass fishing in the state. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Adam, for doing it. You're welcome. Bye.